Well, welcome. We were hoping to meet together for our first um, worship service this Sunday, but you know, due to certain circumstances, we had to postpone it for a couple of weeks. And also, I have my surgery coming up on Friday, and I um, don't know exactly how that's going to pan out. So we're tentatively planning our first service now in June. But I want to encourage you to just you know, be patient with us as we're trying to work all the details. I need to see how things go on Friday and see if everything will come together for us to do what we want to do in June. And I just encourage you to, to be patient um, with us and the deacons as we try to sort through all of this. And we're trying to be careful of your safety as well as um, trying to honor your desire to see us gather together in worship. But because of that, I'm going back to the book of Revelation as we continue to work our way through this book. And it's a very profound book with much for us in there. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll dig in. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessing upon this passage, or as we say this passage, that you'd help us to understand it, to grasp its truth, and Lord, to think about all the implications of what it says there, that we might um, be prepared for the future and know that you are in control and we can trust our lives into your hands. So we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you can tell, I'm not in my office. I'm in quarantine. Um, it started Friday, and it's all the way up till the surgery in the hopes that I will not test positive for the um, coronavirus and can have the procedure on Friday. And that's why I say it's very uncertain about what lies ahead in terms of the surgery and, and what's going to come out of that. Just like we're uncertain about the future, you know, in terms of what, when we live now, when the Lord is coming back, what's all going to happen. But the Lord has given us the book of Revelation. And right now, as we're working through the book, we've just heard the seventh trumpet. We're in chapter 12. And before the unfolding of the contents of the seventh trumpet takes place, which is actually the bold judgments in chapter 15, we have another parenthesis in the book of Revelation. They love parentheses. And chapter 12 through chapter 14 is another one of those parentheses. Because in order for us to understand what is going on in the future, we have to understand that it's there's a spiritual struggle going on. Our struggle, as it says in Ephesians, Paul said, our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with spiritual forces in high places. In other words, the Christian life is part of a spiritual struggle between the forces of darkness and the forces of truth. And it's played out in the lives of human beings. And in order for us to understand the future, we have to understand this spiritual conflict. Otherwise, we'll just see the future as merely the world falling apart and going to pieces, and it's all a result of the sins and evils of mankind. And we're basically destroying this world and destroying each other. But if we understand the truth, that there's actually much more going on, that it's a world of rebellion against his creator, and, he, and God is bringing down the forces of darkness in order to bring the world back in line with his purposes and to cause us to yield once again to our Creator and our God. And it's being unfolded through the one who provided the way of salvation deliverance, the Lamb of God, because he takes away the sins of the world. And he is the one going to restore all things and bring healing and restoration from the results of the fall. And so it's a spiritual struggle between that which is out to destroy us in the world and the one who's come to deliver and set us free. And this portion of scripture brings that out. So turn your Bibles, and I hope you have it open that you can follow along. And we're going to go through Revelation chapter 12, starting at verse 1 and going to verse 6. And he begins this section by introducing the key players that are involved in this great struggle. Chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with a sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Well, the first person we're introduced to is this woman clothed with the sun. Uh, a great sign appeared in heaven, it says, and it was this woman. Now, the word sign is going to be used a couple places here. It's a symbol of a divine truth. 
it represents something. In other words, it's more than just a woman. She's representing something more profound, something even greater. And she's in heaven, but betrays a reality that's going to be taking place on the earth. We see this as we look a little bit further on in this chapter, because this woman is persecuted by Satan in the Great Tribulation. And so that can only happen if she's upon the earth. And the woman is, is pregnant and due to give birth to a son. And so this is something that's unfolding on earth. So the question comes, why does he say this woman is in heaven? Well, she is of heavenly origin. That's where she comes from. And he's talking here about a heavenly kingdom. Remember in the vision of Daniel, you saw the statue of the kingdoms of the earth. And there were four different parts to the session, statue. And the fourth part was actually in two parts. It was of iron and also the partly of iron and clay. Another part of it, so in a sense, it's almost five kingdoms. But it's actually four and then the restoration of the fourth kingdom. But that's the kingdoms of the earth. But then there comes a rock out of heaven that just demolishes all these kingdoms of the earth. And it grows. It starts to grow and it fills the whole earth. And this is a, a different type of kingdom that comes from heaven. It's of heavenly origin. And that's what he's alluding to here with this woman. And this woman, I would argue, is Israel. Israel is the heavenly kingdom. It's a kingdom of heaven origin. It's not that it exists in heaven. It's derived from heaven. It comes from heaven. It's That's where it originated. Just like the stone that came out of heaven came upon the earth and destroyed the earthly kingdoms. And the reason why I think it's this is because Israel is a result of the promises of God to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob. God said, I would make them into a nation from them. Now, they didn't even have any children. Abraham didn't even have any kids when this promise was first made to him. But God had to bring this out. And so despite the infertility of Sarah and later on the infertility of Rebekah, and even with Leah and Rachel, it's brought out that it's God who enables them to have children. And so this, these children, these descendants of Abraham are all miraculously brought into existence. They're the fulfillment of a promise God made to Abraham. So he's bringing this family into existence. And then this family of 70 people, eventually grows into, goes down to the land of Egypt. And they're there for hundreds of years. And while they're there, God enables them to um, be fertile, and they grow into a multitude of people, so many that the Pharaoh of Egypt is nervous about them. He feels overwhelmed because this, these people just keep having children. It's just unnatural. Yes, it's a blessing of God. He said he would make them as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. And so God is growing this family into a people. And so you have all these people, this nation. And then God brings them out, delivers them miraculously from the land of Egypt, where they're in bondage. And they're kept distinct from the Egyptians. He brings them out to Mount Sinai and he makes a covenant with them that he will be their God and they will be his people. And so now he's established them as the people of God. And then he takes them to the land of Canaan, removes the, the, Senate, or the people of the land of Canaan, and he gives them the land, the promised land. And so he makes them a people. He becomes their ruler, their king, their God. And he gives them a place. He makes them into a nation. A nation that never existed before, but God brought it into existence. This is the woman. In fact, often in Scripture, in the Old Testament, Israel is called a woman. She is the bride of Yahweh, his wife, his spouse. In fact, he talks about that quite at length in Jeremiah and other places in the prophets about how she's been an unfaithful wife to him. But it's his woman that he's brought into existence and he's betrothed himself to, his bride. And so that's the nation of Israel. And so it's unlike anything else. And it's even brought out in the reference to her. He refers to her as the sun and under her is the moon and she has 12 stars. Well, in Joseph's dream in Genesis 37 verses 9 through 11, 
he talks about how Joseph had this dream. And in this dream, he saw the sun and the moon and the stars that bowed down to him. And Jacob is the sun, his wife is the moon, and they have 12 children. The 12 tribes of Israel come from them. And so it's a reference to Israel and God making them into a, a nation. So this is a reference to Israel. And it says here about this woman that she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. She's not only a woman, she's a woman in giving birth. Okay, Israel was blessed with being the avenue through which God would bring salvation to the world. In Genesis 3.15, they promised that through the seed of the woman, though the serpent would bruise him, the seed of the woman would bruise or destroy Satan. He would defeat them. And so there was always this concern about this child that was going to come. Well, God brought Israel into existence because that's the avenue which, through which salvation would come into this world. It was being the means by which God would bring deliverance. Because we didn't know what people it would be through. Through whom would it come? It would come through Israel. John 4, 22, Jesus said, salvation is of the Jews. They're the ones who give us the scriptures. They're the ones through whom he, or in whom he chose the apostles. And it's through Israel that the Messiah would come. But it would come not without a price. The reason why is because Israel being the one through whom the Savior of the world would come, who would bring about the defeat of Satan, there's a great hostility against Israel. And so they've had to suffer throughout their history. And he compares it to being birth pains because being the chosen one through whom the Messiah would come meant that Israel would have to go through great hardships and difficulty in preparation for the Son of God coming into this world. It's like birth pains. It has to happen before that which is promised can come about. And so in Egypt, as God multiplied Israel and made them into a people, Satan used Pharaoh to try to destroy them by killing the children of Israel. Even in our recent, fairly recent history, we have the Holocaust in World War II where Hitler, being influenced by Satan, I believe, tried to wipe out the Jews and destroy them. We have great anti-Semitism even in our day, and, and the Islamic nations have sought the destruction of Israel and want to see it wiped off the earth. There's almost an unnatural, in fact, there almost there is an unnatural hatred of Israel and the Jews. Why? Because that's the woman through whom the child will come. The promised child from the very beginning to Adam and Eve, who would destroy the serpent. Which brings us to the next section, verses 3 through 4 of Revelation 12. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Well, there's the great red dragon. The language here is from Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. After this, I saw in the night vision, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue from the feet of it, and was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns, and I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked off by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and the mouth speaking great things. Well, this is clearly a reference to that final kingdom, a revival of the Roman Empire, if you will, uh, under the Antichrist. But what's bringing out, it's not talking so much about the nation, it's talking about the power behind that nation, which is Satan himself. The dragon is the power behind it, and the dragon is Satan himself, a fearful, beastly creature 
with great power, the devil himself. And it says that tell of the dragon shall draw a third of the part of the stars. Well, the stars are angelic beings, and one third of the angels fell with Lucifer and came down upon this earth. They were cast out of heaven itself, and they bring great destruction and heartache upon the world. A third of the angels rebelled with them. Demonic powers. That's why it says in Ephesians, that I already mentioned, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power in heavenly places. Satan is in rebellion against God. And he's brought down many of the angelic creatures with him, and he brings down a lot of the human race. And they exert their influence upon this world. They could not hurt heaven. That's why they're expelled from it. So they attack God's creation, God's people particularly, and bring about great heartache and great destruction. See, Satan, when he couldn't beat God and bring him down, he turns his hostility against that which God loves, particularly his people, Israel. And that's why he's seeking to destroy them. And he's been seeking to destroy them from the very beginning. To destroy the child when he is born, it says here. Because his main hatred is not primarily against Israel. I don't want to kind of communicate that. It's against Israel because Israel is the means by which the Savior of the world will come and has come and will come again. And it's him that he wants to destroy. The child that's born to the woman. He'll seek to destroy the child when he is born. Well, this happened. He, he tried to do it in the past by you know, causing Israel to be infertile. He sought the death of the male children in Egypt when Pharaoh sought to kill them and have them thrown them into the river. Um, child sacrifices they turned Israel to even with the kings of Israel. And in Haman, in the book of Esther, he tried to destroy the Jews because he doesn't want this child to come. But the primary place that he's alluding to here is a reference to when Jesus was actually born into this world through the Virgin Mary, that when Herod heard of it, who was the false king of Israel, heard that the true king of Israel was born into this world, immediately Satan prompted him to try to have the children killed. Two years and younger. And all these children were killed because Satan is out to destroy this child. And that brings us to the third person here, the child himself. Verses 5 and 6. And she, this woman, brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand Two hundred and threescore days. Well, the child was destined to become the ultimate ruler of the world. Psalm two nine mentions this: "Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron; thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel." So it's clearly a, an allusion to that passage that there's coming this Son of God who will be king over the world, and he is to be born into this world. Now, some try to make this into the church, the raptured church, perhaps. But the church is not the child of Israel, nor is the church to rule over all the nations. A child is specifically said to be a male child. Ecclesia, the word for church, is feminine, and that's why often the church is alluded to as the bride of Christ. This is a male child born to Israel. Well, some say it was fulfilled when he fled after Jesus was born, they acknowledge it had to be Christ himself. But they say it was fulfilled when he fled to Egypt. But it says that he's being caught up to the throne of God, where he is sent to the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And it does not fit with the situation in Egypt, where he just went there as a child and came back shortly thereafter. He never ruled from Egypt. So it doesn't fit with that. This is talking about the ascension of Christ into heaven. The child is caught up. Now get the picture. It's kind of skipping ahead quickly in this description. But here the child has finally come. And it's born into this world. 
and Satan sought to kill the baby, but didn't succeed. And then he went, um, stirred up the scribes and the Pharisees and the Roman um, leadership to have him crucified, to put this child to death. But he ascended, he rose from the dead, and he ascended to heaven, and it's like he's caught up into heaven itself. And so he lived, he survived that, and now he's placed at the right hand of God the Father. And he's over all. He's been exalted above everything. And so Satan has failed. The, the son has captured. The child has survived, despite the attack of Satan. And now he takes his frustration and his anger out upon the people through which the child came, the Jews, and upon the church that proclaims the message of the son. And that's why he is breaking out in hostility particularly against the nation of Israel, out to destroy them. This child has escaped his attack, but now he's out to destroy Israel. And that's why it's not surprising that after Jesus ascended into heaven, probably around 33 AD, then 70 AD, Israel is destroyed, and the temple wiped out, and the people of Israel are scattered. Then it jumps to the time in which we're at in the book of Revelation. All this was just preparing the way for us to understand what's going on. And now the devil has focused his attack once again upon Israel because he knows the end is coming. And he's out to wipe out the people of Israel, to keep the kingdom from coming into existence. And they, he has led his tool in this world, the Antichrist, to turn upon Israel in the middle of the tribulation period and so we're at the last part of the tribulation. It's called the Great Tribulation. And that's in verse 6. And the children fled into the wilderness. Once he turned on Israel at the abomination of desolation, the remaining surviving Israelites, because God has preserved the nation of Israel all the way to the end, shall flee into the wilderness to hide. And God will protect them. He's already sent, as we learned earlier, the two witnesses to help protect Israel and preserve them there in the middle of the wilderness. And they shall be there a thousand two hundred and three score days. One thousand two hundred and sixty days, three and a half years, the last half of the tribulation period. And God is preserving the nation of Israel because they're getting ready for the child to return and set up his kingdom upon the earth. And so there's three major entities as we've gone through this. We have Israel, because everything revolves around God fulfilling his promises to Israel. Israel is the means by which God exerts his influence upon this world, his rule. It's the, through Israel that he sent the Messiah into the world. And then you have Satan, who's out to destroy the child and destroy Israel, and he's opposing God fulfilling his promises to Israel, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to keep this from happening. And the key element around which these two are struggling, Israel to bring about their Messiah and see him brought into the world in fulfillment of the promises given to them, and Satan now to destroy Israel and destroy the child, is the child himself. And what happens with a child determines who's victorious. And Satan has failed to destroy the child. The child has been protected in the very presence of God because even though he killed him, he came back to life, and he ascended into heaven. And now he's preparing to return. Because the child is Jesus Christ. The child is a Lamb of God, who's unfolding his plan in this world in preparation for him to come and set up his kingdom. To destroy Satan, with the kingdom of Israel being established upon the earth, and Israel's reign extending across the whole world, but not the national Israel, the earthly kingdom, but the heavenly kingdom that God promised to bring about and to bring into existence. And it's going to be brought about through the child who shall rule over all the earth and bring blessings to everyone. And so this unfolding of God's plan upon the earth is a fulfillment of a spiritual struggle that's going on where that evil serpent, that dragon, who helped bring sin into this world is going to finally be defeated. And so God's plan will be unfolding. 
and I think probably very soon. And so be ready, prepare yourself, because Jesus, the child, is coming back. The one born in Bethlehem came to lay down his life for the sins of the world upon the cross. And the child died and was buried. But he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and he's at the right hand of God the Father. And God's going to exert his rule upon the world when he sends that child back. The fulfillment of the hope of Israel. Because God has preserved Israel from the attacks of the enemy. That their promised Messiah might come and rule over them. And when that happens, Satan will be defeated. The dragon will be conquered. And the Son of God shall reign supreme. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious hope that we have. And Lord, we look forward to the unfolding of your plan. I'm thankful, Lord, that you never forgot your promises. And that, Lord, what we're seeing happen in this world is really the fulfillment of what we will see happen, a fulfillment of a spiritual battle that's gone on for thousands of years. But, Lord, it's coming to a conclusion. And, Lord, we want to be part of that. May we live in light of that hope. And Lord, as we look at things going on in the world today, we realize that's coming soon. Everything is being prepared. We look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we look forward to the coming of your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you and keep walking with the Lord.